Chapter 27 My dear Wormwood, You seem to be doing very little good at present. The use of his love to distract his mind from the enemy is, of course, obvious, but you reveal what poor use you are making of it when you say that the whole question of distraction and the wandering mind has now become one of the chief subjects of his prayers. That means you have largely failed. When this or any other distraction crosses his mind, you ought to encourage him to thrust it away by sheer willpower and to try to continue the normal prayer as if nothing had happened. Once he accepts the distraction as his present problem and lays that before the enemy and makes it the main theme of his prayers and his endeavors, then, so far from doing good, you have done harm. Anything, even a sin, which has the total effect of moving him closer up to the enemy, makes against us in the long run. A promising line is the following. Now that he is in love, a new idea of earthly happiness has arisen in his mind. Hence, a new urgency in his purely petitionary prayers about this war and other such matters. Now is the time for raising intellectual difficulties about prayers of that sort. False spirituality is always to be encouraged. On the seemingly pious ground that praise and communion with God is the true prayer, humans can often be lured into direct disobedience to the enemy, who, in his usual flat, commonplace, uninteresting way, has definitely told them to pray for their daily bread and the recovery of their sick. You will, of course, conceal from him the fact that the prayer for daily bread, interpreted in a spiritual sense, is really just as crudely petitionary as it is in any other sense. But since your patient has contracted the terrible habit of obedience, he will probably continue such crude prayers, whatever you do. But you can worry him with the haunting suspicion that the practice is absurd and can have no objective result. Don't forget to use the heads-I-win, tails-you-lose argument. If the thing he prays for doesn't happen, then that is one more proof that petitionary prayers don't work. And if it does happen, he will, of course, be able to see some of the physical causes which led up to it, and therefore it would have happened anyway. And thus, a granted prayer becomes just as good a proof as a denied one that prayers are ineffective. You, being a spirit, will find it difficult to understand how he gets into this confusion, but you must remember that he takes time for an ultimate reality. Your patient supposes that the enemy, like himself, sees some things as present, and remembers other things as past, and anticipates others as future, or even if he believes that the enemy does not see things that way, yet in his heart of hearts he regards this as a peculiarity of the enemy's mode of perception. He doesn't really think, though he would say he did, that things as the enemy sees them are things as they are. If you tried to explain to him that men's prayers today are one of the innumerable coordinates with which the enemy harmonizes the weather of tomorrow, he would reply then, the enemy always knew men were going to make those prayers, and if so, they did not pray freely, but were predestined to do so. <laughs>
and he would add that the weather on a given day can be traced back through its causes to the original creation of matter itself, so that the whole thing, both on the human and on the material side, is given from the word go. What he ought to say, of course, is obvious to us, that the problem of adapting the particular weather to the particular prayers is merely the appearance, at two points in his temporal mode of perception, of the total problem of adapting the whole spiritual universe to the whole corporeal universe, that creation in its entirety operates at every point of time and space, or rather, that their kind of consciousness forces them to encounter the whole self-consistent creative act as a series of successive events. Why that creative act leaves room for their free will is the problem of problems, the secret behind all the enemy's nonsense about love. How it does so is no problem at all, for the enemy does not foresee the humans making their free contributions in a future, but sees them doing so in his unbounded now. And obviously, to watch a man doing something is not to make him do it. It may be replied that some meddlesome human writers, most notably Bothius, have let this secret out. But in the intellectual climate which we have at last succeeded in producing throughout Western Europe, you needn't bother about that. Only the learned read old books, and we have now so dealt with the learned that they are, of all men, the least likely to acquire wisdom by doing so. <laughs> We have done this by inculcating the historical point of view. The historical point of view, put briefly, means that when a learned man is presented with any statement in an ancient author, the one question he never asks is whether it is true. He asks who influenced the ancient writer, uh, how far the statement is consistent with what he said in other books, and what phase in the writer's development, or in the general history of thought it illustrates, and how it affects later writers, and how often it has been misunderstood, especially by the learned man's own colleagues, and what the general course of criticism on it has been for the last ten years, and what is the present state of the question. <laughs> to regard the ancient writer as a possible source of knowledge, to anticipate that what he said could possibly modify your thoughts and your behavior. This would be rejected as unutterably simple-minded. And since we cannot deceive the whole human race all the time, it is important, thus, to cut every generation off from all others. For where learning makes a free commerce between the ages, there is always the danger that the characteristic errors of one may be corrected by the characteristic truths of another. But thanks be to our father, and the historical point of view, great scholars are now as little nourished by the past as the most ignorant mechanic who holds that History is bunk. <laughs> Your affectionate uncle, Screwtape.